We asked you to ask us, and you asked us. Christine Alonzo, with your Ask Us Anything questions. We're trying something a little new this week. We thought we would do a little Ask Us Anything. You guys quite frequently have questions for us, so we like amassed them all in one place, and we got so many. Thank you so much for responding with so many thoughtful questions. We're going to get to a bunch of them today, and if we don't get to yours, we will do another one of these, I promise. Um, but we've got a bunch already. We're going to start with John Robertson, who asks, we're going to start with a simple one here. Mm. What are your thoughts on taking notes with pen and paper during an in-theater screening? Do a lot of reviewers do it? Do you find it helpful? I stopped doing it because I couldn't read my handwriting afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and I found sometimes if I was looking down or writing, I would right. miss something. So now I've just sort of trained myself to kind of like, if there's like a line or a quote or something that I want to remember later that I just like make it a point to memorize it because I just, I don't get anywhere with the note taking. If I'm reviewing for Ebert, I do take notes. If I'm just watching it, or like I'm doing it for this, uh -huh. where it's a conversation, I, I sure. do not take notes. Like, but if it's like a piece of dialogue, as you say, or like a, a costume choice or a camera angle or something really specific that I wanna know, I'll write it down. But I find that increasingly I don't really use them. Like I've been doing this for 23 years now and I don't really use my notes anymore. <laughs> yeah, I just, it, it, I found it distracting and I found that I could be like, I, I could I could sort of make myself remember a thing just long enough for when I have to write about it and then it'll like fly right out of my head. Our brains are sieves. Okay, yes. number two um, from Cybertron for the win one. Hello, your question is, I know it's not completely safe yet, but have you guys kept an eye on when it might be safe to do reviews physically together slash in person uh. again? Is that something you might want to go back to doing eventually? I totally miss you and would love to see you. And I'm psyched yes. to see you next week at Dr. Strange. Yes. Um, but you live really far away from me. And <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we've talked about it and we'll probably do it at some point soon, but like it's a, for, for her to come to me or for me to go to her is a schlep. Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> The, the, this has kind of been one of the upsides of the pandemic is, yeah. oh, we could just do this virtually and not have to add two hours to our day to like, you know, make the, the, the commute. Right. That's the thing. But we, we will again one of these days, yes. but it is it is a little more convenient to do it this way. So thank you for asking. Yes. Stephanie Lenz says, I'd like to hear about what some call guilty pleasure movies that you have zero guilt whatsoever about loving, like adamantly guilt free affection. I know you have many of these. <laughs> I refuse to feel guilty. I, I don't be, I, I don't believe in the guilty pleasure. I think that pleasure is pleasure. And so, <laughs> yes, you can you can see a movie and know that it's not a great film and it's not an important film or or that it you know it doesn't hue to your aesthetics but if it gives you pleasure it gives you pleasure so like I, I get pleasure every time I watch the Apple, the 1980, you know, a Menachem Golan musical that is also a biblical allegory that is also a disco explosion. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's ridiculous and frequently inept, but I like it a lot. And so, yeah, that is a pleasure movie for me. So is, you know, uh, Valley of the Dolls and, and uh, After Last Season and the Mexican Santa Claus and all kinds of films. <laughs> For me, it's Grease 2 and Xanadu. They are very important, like early film touchstones for me that sure. I love with zero irony. So yeah. yeah, I'm with you. Like if you like it, you like it. It's a guilty exactly. pleasure. Um, Anthony Post asks, what is one review from your past you would most like to update because you have a new perspective on it, either good or bad, thanks. It's, this came up recently in a, a, a conversation about like, uh, where where you radically change your mind about a film. When I was in college, I went to a public sneak of National Lampoon's European Vacation <laughs> with a packed house, and I thought, oh, this movie is hilarious. <laughs> and then I and I wrote a review about it for my college paper, and then I saw it again. I took a friend of mine, and we were like, there were like five people in the theater, and it was a lead balloon. Uh, so that's one that certainly leaps to mind. Um, I don't revisit a lot of movies, so mm -hmm. I don't. There aren't a ton of them that I can that I've watched a second time and gone, ugh. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure if I did, I would. But you know, mine is Pootie Tang. <laughs> I saw Pootie Tang at the Paramount Screening Room in New York when it came out. And it was me and one other person and mm. I did not laugh. I'm like, I do not get this. And then it came on cable and I laughed my ass off. I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> it's supposed to be stupid. And like, yes. I, I, and it's a movie that like has gotten quoted, like the whole like, oh, yeah. Sadate Ma Dilly and sign your name on the runny kind. Sign you know, your pity on a runny kind. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
it's a, it's a movie that has seeped its way into the culture and I, I have come to appreciate it. So I was wrong. I actually, I wrote an open letter to Chris Rock when I was still at the AP, like, dear Chris Rock, I'm so sorry, I got it wrong. So there you go. <laughs> he did directed not respond. By, directed by Louis C.K. <laughs> oh yes, that's true. That's a little tidbit. All right, Mike's Book Vlogs asks, I know this is super random, but what did you think of the movie Showgirls? Speaking of guilty pleasures, back in 1995, <laughs> what do you think of it now? It's my favorite movie ever. Saw it for the first time when I was like 15, expecting to derisively hate watch it, and my gay ass has been head over heels in love <laughs> with it ever since. We like showgirls around here. Um, a good friend of mine, Jeff McHale, did a whole documentary on it yes. called You Don't Know Me, and we had him on the podcast. I'll link yep. to that below. Um, we like showgirls. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, I do it. The first time I saw it, I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And and I was a little let down because uh, Verhoeven at the time had been doing all these interviews about how, oh, it's NC-17, all bets are off. And he was like, frankly, he promised a lot of boners and there are none in Showgirls, which I thought was a, a big uh, yeah. a cop out on his part because it was, <laughs> he was already getting an NC-17. Um, but yeah, I, you know, Jacques Rivette says it's a great movie and I, who am I to disagree with him? I, <laughs> I think that for, for everything about it that is maybe a little bit clumsy and overdone, uh, it is a rather blistering satire about show business, uh, not viewed through the lens of Hollywood, but by the lens, viewed through the lens of Las Vegas, which is the much sleazier version of Hollywood. I just think about how enduring it is from a cultural perspective all these oh, yeah. years later. You know, I mean, it's something that is referenced and people have come to appreciate, which is what You Don't Know Me is about. It's also an early date that my husband and I went on. <laughs> 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 and we're still married 25 years later. So there it turned out okay for us. Look, mediocre, you forget. But movies like Showgirls, yeah, stay with you forever. For sure. Um, okay, Mariko True, who is a longtime viewer and follower and commenter of ours, says, because of COVID, I have been spending a lot of time and money on streaming services. I currently subscribe to Amazon Prime, Netflix, HBO Max, and Disney+. Plus. Let's say I have another $10 to $15 a month added to my entertainment budget. What's one additional streaming service I should add? Perhaps should I save that money for rentals? Um, we end up doing a lot of Hulu programming on our Patreon. We True. end up doing like The Handmaid's Tale, The Dropout, Pam and Tommy. Those are all on Hulu. There's a really cute- The Great. Yeah, The Great is great. Um, there's a really cute um, gay high school rom-com coming out this week called Crush that's on Hulu. So that'd uh, be my got vote. Yeah, Fire Island is coming up in June, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, Hulu is pretty great. I mean, the Criterion Channel, obviously, if if that's the kind of film that floats your boat, sort of like classic indie art house kind of films, they always have really great curating and, and interesting programming going on. And never forget, if you have a library card, check and see if you have access to Canopy with a K, because it's free with a library card. You get 10 views a month. Also, Hoopla uh, has a lot of stuff as well. So those are some, some good freebies to check into if, that's you, true. if your library system as a subscriber to that's them. true canopy with a k very good yes. um a couple more have you ever been hesitant this is from someone named deliberately he deliberately mm. did not put his or her name okay. uh have you ever been hesitant or nervous to submit an honest review i imagine it might be hard to criticize a film that might have friends attached or something and i try to okay, oh sorry no is there more i, I try to go ahead I try to recuse myself if 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 anybody I know is in is in, is involved in a film because I don't want to be in the position of of not liking it. And also, I believe that if I if I like it and I'm like close friends with somebody involved, then it it's kind of a cheat and people aren't going to believe me even right. if I do tell them that it's good. So yeah, that's kind of been my rule. I feel like for the most part, we need to not be friends with these people. I mean, like friendly and to. polite, but not yeah. tight. Um, having said that, like one of our closest friends is a guy named Phil Johnston, who wrote and he wrote the Wreck-It Ralph movies and Zootopia, oh. wrote and directed Wreck-It Ralph 2. But we've known him for 20 years. He and his wife lived in the same loft building with us in Brooklyn. Oh, I'll wow. never review a thing he does. Yeah, we no. knew him before he got big. So. Yeah, I knew Justin Simeon before he became, yeah. you know, the Dear White People and Beyond guy. So mm -hmm. I was like, I can't review you, sorry. Yeah. Um, and his, his other question is, what's the best slash worst part about being a film critic? Love the channel, What the Flick and LK stands unite, haha. -ha. So thank Ooh, you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, the the best part is that it's what I've always wanted to do and be. Uh, and, you know, it gives me an opportunity to keep up with new movies and to 
try and put them into some sort of context and share my thoughts about them with folks. And, and that's always been exciting. And that people respond to that and are interested is, is, is something I never take for granted. You know, the worst part is I think people who are people who are bad actors, you know, and I, and I don't mean that in the, in the, in the literal sense. I mean, people online who assume that, Oh, we're on the Marvel payroll or that we aren't being honest about what we think, or we're trying to push some agenda or blah, blah, blah. And, or who just get nasty and kind of petty about, opinions which is what these come down to it's like sorry i didn't like the superhero movie that you haven't seen yet yeah. but have already decided to invest in as a personality like you know that's a shitty part but it's very much a minor thing and you know look i'm as i always say i'm not a janitor in a slaughterhouse i can't complain about my job yeah i just feel like it's it's a privilege to be able to write and talk about what i love and what i've always loved since my earliest days and i view it as like what we are doing is the beginning of a conversation and then it Absolutely. goes on from there. And then we are engaging with you guys and love hearing back from you. So that's a real pleasure. Worst part is that we have to kind of see everything. And as you were saying earlier <laughs> yeah, with showgirls, like if something is great or something is terrible in a fascinating way, that's exciting. But yes. the vast majority of movies are like mediocre and in the middle, like all those two star reviews are very hard <laughs> to write. Getting pumped yes. up about a movie that you feel like really blah about is hard. Like so, Dave always says, whenever you see a trailer on TV and you go, Ugh, I don't want to see that. We have to go see it. We have to see those. Those are our <laughs> job. Um, Leon Kuwata asks, who came up with the title Breakfast All Day? My guess is Alonzo. I don't recall it that way. Dave White. That was a Dave White title. We were at your house. Yes, having we, brunch. We were and... having breakfast in the middle of the day. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and you know, as with Linoleum Knife, Dave is like, look, you cannot call the show anything that's like the movie this or the film that because uh, it's been done to death on the internet. So yeah. yeah, he said breakfast all day. Everyone likes it. Everyone likes it. Yeah. So it was you and me and Matt sitting at your table eating Dave White's delicious pancakes. Yes. And uh, we're like, sure. Who hasn't liked breakfast all day? This sounds <laughs> exactly. really great. Um, also, several of you, speaking of Matt, several of you have been yes. so nice to ask about Matt, not just with this Q&A round here, but over the last six months. And we haven't really said a whole lot because there really isn't anything new to say. You've been so kind to check in on him. He felt like he needed to step away for a bit about six, seven months ago. And of course, we respect that. And nothing has really changed since then. There's no animosity. There's no falling no, out. Nothing it's, but love here. Yeah. And like, we hope he's doing well. And uh, we unfortunately haven't seen him or talked to him much in all this time, but he's doing what he needs to do. And, you know, the love is definitely there radiating from our end. And so, um, and clearly from yours as well, since many of you guys have asked about him. So that's all we got. We don't mean to be evasive, but we don't really no, know anything. No, it's it's kind of where we are. <laughs> all right. This was fun and we yes. love doing it and we'll do more. We got so many questions. We'll get to more next time, but uh, thank you so much for submitting those and for caring. Yes, in thanks you guys. <laughs> Bye.